Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about is um, uh, a lot of people are, are, are buzzing about machine learning right now. We're excited about it. We're trying to apply it. There's lots of in-house projects that are looking to apply methods that already exist to solve big problems. We can smell a machine learning problem. We know because data acquisition is really expensive and we've got a ton of data. Now what methods do we, do we apply to, to solve these problems? That's the hard part. And one thing that doesn't work very good is just opening up a textbook or taking a course and then applying the methods directly from there to solve problems. And the reason for that is that engineering problems require a bit of a different angle. And so what I describe uh, Salito as doing is really machine learning for engineering applications. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what differentiates just standard machine learning from machine learning for engineering applications. It's really, there's three areas here. Uh, massive data, certainly, um, hello. <laughs> uh, certainly uh, uh, we have a lot of data um, uh, in any machine learning application. The thing that's kind of unique is our data in, in, uh, in uh, engineering, a lot of it's streaming data. You know, we collect historic data, but we're also collecting data in real time as we're running our analyses, and we need to be able to analyze those in real time. Second thing is this stuff's complicated. Uh, the, the data here, we can make very few assumptions about, about its nature. Uh, there are a lot of dimensions. There's all kinds of, uh, of tricky things there. And the third thing is that, um, you know, in engineering, our bridges need to stand, our chips need to work, and we can't really bet our designs on, on estimates. We have to have really good evidence that our answers are correct. So I'm going to talk about these three things, which I think really characterize the difference between standard machine learning and machine learning for engineering. So massive data, well, we certainly have massive data, like I said, in every machine learning uh, type area. But what we've got here is, imagine a whole bunch of SPICE simulators, you know, 2,000 of them uh, working in parallel, uh, working on solving a problem for a chip that we've never seen before on a manufacturing process that we've never seen before. Certainly, we can gather some information for how things have behaved in the past and start to shape our models from that, but there's a lot of real-time data happening here. So what we're doing essentially is real-time machine learning. We're streaming in information and building models in real time. So what we need to be able to do, do this is uh, things like optimized streaming parsers, things that can actually read this data efficiently as it's coming in, uh, parallelizable algorithms. A lot of the, the machine learning technologies that are out there don't actually parallelize that well. They run on, you know, single CPUs or small number of CPUs. We need this to run on thousands of CPUs to keep up with the, uh, the rate at which data is coming in. We also need um, really you know, scalable cluster management, uh, being able to actually distribute and dispatch all these jobs while bringing everything together into a single central model is a very hard problem in itself. We need automated recovery and repair. Things go wrong when you're streaming uh, real-time data and you need to be able to say, oh, okay, that's okay uh, that that went wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out what to do about it. Uh, sometimes you get incorrect answers coming in, which can pollute your models that you're building. And, and being able to filter that and adapt it and adjust it and correct from it is really hard. This is something that you have to do in this space and it's very hard to do. And then also being able to figure out you know, what went wrong and being able to debug real-time streaming data is uh, quite, quite challenging. So that's the first thing that you have to be able to deal with uh, when you're doing machine learning for, for engineering or certainly in the chip space. The second problem here is complexity. So uh, here we've got, in, uh, imagine a chip, I mean, you've got lots of transistors. If you're looking at process variation, a, a space that we li live in, um, there's, there's each one of those transistors has got models for how it varies. And so, you know, a chip that's got thousands of transistors, you might have tens of thousands of variables. Uh, these all interact. These aren't simple, standalone type, type of uh, responses that we're looking at. They all interact, and they interact in tricky ways. Uh, Nonlinear interactions, interactions with discontinuities, uh, very, very tricky stuff. And so what we need to be able to handle this is technology that can, uh, first of all, uh, do an effective design of experiments. Uh, given, given this large space, how do you start to collect some information about it? You can't just go run everything because now you've defeated the purpose. We have to pick some places to start. And some, so some really good design of experiment, uh, experiments technology is really important. 
The second thing is we, we need advanced supervised learning techniques. Basically what this is, is, uh, is a bunch of different ways of, uh, of, of modeling data, um, some of which are, are very accurate, some of which are very fast, very scalable, uh, different methods, and different methods that we can actually apply to a single solution. We don't just use one. Uh, sometimes we'll need to sort of work uh, with multiple different types of models that kind of filter down into the thing that we want. Um, uh, intelligent screening and filtering. One thing that we don't want to do is throw away important variables, variables that will be important in, under some conditions. They don't look important in our initial experiments, but as we start zoning in on our areas of interest, they might become important. So how do we make sure we don't filter the wrong things? We've got sometimes tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dimensions we need to filter, but how do you make sure you're not filtering the wrong things? Um, one of the things that's really important here for handling this, this data complexity is having a benchmarking infrastructure that can actually, uh, you know, have uh, a really quick way to test what you're doing against, you know, things that happen in the real world. Uh, we've got 20,000 test cases that run automa automatically uh, that we can run, you know, in whole or in part uh, overnight on, on large clusters, which is really useful. And, and the other thing, I mean, I guess the last thing is, is just a big toolbox. If you have lots of tools, a whole bunch of different tools that you can use, and you know how to put them together, uh, you've probably got a good basis for being able to handle this kind of complexity that we've got in this space. It's not an easy space to, to apply machine learning to. Um, and then the third thing, this is probably actually the most important thing. If you're going to actually implement a machine learning technology in a production flow, is you have to have the right answer. If the answer is not right, people won't use your answer. And so it's great, you know, if you can say, hey, I'll save, you know, 10 times or make something 100, 100 or 1,000 times faster or save weeks. If at the end of the day there's risk that you might have a respin as a result or risk that you might be massively over margining still, um, people won't actually adopt that solution. So how do you do that given that with machine learning techniques, we're essentially building a big estimator. This isn't the real answer anymore, we've got a big estimator. Uh, well, you can't just give people that and say, well, just trust it. You know, the data around that region looks like it supports this answer. That's not good enough for a lot of engineering decisions. So what we need actually is, is accuracy-aware modeling techniques. And this is hard. There aren't that many accuracy-aware modeling techniques in the world uh, today, not in textbooks. You have to invent them. You have to come up with them. Um, we need active learning approaches where we can incrementally figure out where areas of interest are. Usually they're around our worst cases. You know, show us where my chip, show me where my chip's likely to fail and then go get lots of resolution in that area. So we want to actively go direct experiments into, into areas of interest. And, and having active learning methods that are really, really good at targeting problem areas is super important. The third thing, this is actually really, uh, might be the most important thing that I'm going to say today, is self-verifying algorithms. And the reason for this is if you can't prove to an engineer that the answer is right, they're not going to take the answer. Even if you can describe the technology and it's been right before, it's been right before a lot of times, maybe it's been right before thousands of times, how do they know it's right in their case? Well, if the algorithm can't prove its correctness, people are really hesitant to use that technology and bet their design on it. So if you can design things, design algorithms that actually are verifiable and in fact can implement the verification as part of the technology so that uh, when you give an answer, you don't just give an answer, but you show that it's the correct answer. You prove uh, at runtime that it's actually the right answer. That's really compelling uh, to people and that's what makes this stuff work in production. Um, and, and then also, you know, being able to prove through lots and lots of data helps, uh, uh, you know, having lots of cases where you can show that it's worked, um, not just on your data, but actually on customer data, um, uh, having, having or, 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 or data on site, real production data that, that you know is yours and you, you know is based on your chips and your processes and your design practices, then, then you can believe this a lot more. So, you know, being able to run hundreds of cases or thousands of cases and show that it gives the right answer again and again at uh, brute force compared to brute force is really uh, nice for building confidence as well. Um, so that's, uh, that's really the three uh, main, main problem areas. We've got our, our massive data, we've got uh, data complexity, uh, correctness, and we need technologies above and beyond what's in the machine learning textbooks and, and uh, research today in order to actually build machine learning based solutions for, for engineering. Um, 
Salido's been at this for, uh, for 12 years. I, I was at Salido for 11 of those. And uh, we've, we've implemented these solutions into two product lines. Our first one was Variation Designer. That's a, a production tool that uses uh, a lot of different uh, machine learning techniques for, um, for differentiating against the status quo. Um, people don't come to Salido because we have the same solution as everyone else. They come to us because our solutions are 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times faster, but still accurate and still provable. You can still make engineering decisions based on the, the results. The second set of tools is a newer one. Uh, we just announced it this year. It's called Machine Learning Characterization Suite. And this is basically applying a lot of what we know, a lot of our tools in the toolbox to, to the problem of uh, library uh, timing characterization. And uh, we, can, we can speed up uh, uh, that process by weeks uh, uh, as well uh, with machine learning uh, technologies. This is for standard cell memory I.O. Uh, uh, type, type of, uh, of problems. Another thing that we're doing that we just announced recently is ML Labs. We know there are a lot of other problems in this space that our, that our customers have that, that still exist in the world that aren't solved yet by machine learning technologies. And there are a lot of initiatives to uh, apply machine learning technologies to try and solve problems. And what we want to do is act as the glue. Uh, so, so basically be able to, um, to take, uh, you know, customer problems, collaborate with them on it, you know, run a proof of concept using real data, make sure that it's actually a reasonable direction, and then ultimately bring new products to market in, in new spaces. Uh, so so that's, a, that's a new initiative that we've got at, at uh, Salido as well on the machine learning side. So that's just a little bit of information about, uh, about uh, machine learning for engineering, uh, sharing some of the things that have made that successful uh, in production, things that you really need to think about if, um, if you're looking to apply machine learning uh, solutions uh, uh, to, solve, to solve your problems. Thanks. Yield uh, improvement and pessimism reduction. So what does Solido do specifically uh, with the same BSIM models and variation blocks that others don't, and what do you improve there exactly? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, when designers are faced with uncertainty, they'll over margin. Chips need to work, and so that. Uh, so I think the way to uh, to, to best address this is that. Um, in order to make designers want to reduce margins, you have to give them a lot more certainty in the quality of the answers. So uh, with machine learning technologies, you can get a lot more coverage. Let's say you've got a fixed amount of schedule, you can get a lot more coverage of the space, which uh, can give you a lot more uh, 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 information, a lot more confidence that you've actually found all of the worst cases, you know how everything behaves, then you can make much more aggressive design decisions. That's the biggest thing that, that leads to over margin reduction. Uh, we've got tools that analyze that, we've got tools that help people fix it uh, as well, uh, but, but it's really about that confidence and reducing uncertainty. Uh, that's where the, the gold happens, uh, uh, because designers make uh, more aggressive decisions when they, have, when they think they've got the right answer.